you'll still be lonely because the ministry is a call to, listen now, listen, not only loneliness, but onlyness. Only. Because in some situations, you're the only one that knows what's going on. You're the only one that sees it through spiritual eyes. What I wanted to do in these three days is say to the pastors here, you ain't by yourself. Don't you dare think that because some churches are full now that the pastors are finally breathing a sigh of relief and whew, glad that's over. No, it's painful because now we've got a different kind of work to do. But God didn't call you to speak to thousands or two. He called you to speak to people in his name. And they, he's put that word in your mouth. So I cherish the title preacher. Now, again, I, I don't know that I can say this so that it will be received the right way. I, I don't have doctor on my... In fact, I don't have a desk here at the church. I don't have an office. My office is at home. I let them run it down there. But on my desk at home... I have a hand-carved, wooden hand-carved sign that says, Preacher. And sometimes I stand there and look at it. Because I still find it hard to believe that he laid his hand on me. I don't get used to this. After 44 years, I'm not used to this. I can't believe that I get to stand up and speak in his name. I, I, I struggle with the fact that he's laid his hand on me and he's put a word in my mouth. Preacher. I think it's a, amazing that in the 11th chapter of Hebrews, I don't know why I'm so emotional today. Maybe it's Monday. That's what it is. I'm a nervous wreck. I, I broke myself down yesterday. I'm not crazy. I'm tired. Oh, I feel so much better right now. I just analyze my own self. I'm ACDC. Or ADD, you know. ADD. <laughs> 11th chapter of Hebrews. Notice how the writer said, Noah, a preacher of righteousness. Not a shipbuilder. Not a businessman. A preacher. Notice how the writer referred to Jesus, the one that came and preached peace. Preached. Jesus was a preacher. Hey, and if I can find it right quick, notice how Paul referred to himself. I believe it's first, help me, Lord, uh, first Timothy, I think it is. Let it be there, God. Yes, 1 Timothy 2, uh, I've preached, there's one God, one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Listen, for which I was appointed a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher. Did you notice the order that Paul referred to himself? He said, first of all, I'm a preacher. And then I'm an apostle. And then I'm a, I'm a teacher. He held this call to preach higher than the other calls in his life. And he said that twice. He said it in 2 Timothy, the same, the same thing. A preacher. I don't know how to say this other than you have a special mouth. God put a word in your mouth. It, it, it kind of reminds me of when Jesus said to his apostles, the day is coming when they're going to drag you into courts and synagogues and beat you and you'll stand before rulers and elders. And, and he said, do not meditate beforehand what you will say. For I will give you a mouth. And wisdom in that hour, 
Now, he's not saying don't study and don't prepare yourself, so don't, don't take it that way. He was just saying don't be overly concerned with what comes out of your mouth because you've planned it with your mind. I'll give you a word and a mouth which all of your enemies will not be able to resist or gainsay. Do you realize how special it is for God in all of eternity, I should say, in all of the history of man and in all of the human beings to reach down and pick you up, put a word in your mouth and say, you're special unto me. I didn't call you because you're smart. And I didn't call you because you're articulate. I called you because I called you. And if I call you, I'm going to give you a word to say to the people. Isn't that an amazing thing? You said it this morning, Pastor. You can't go, you can't go anywhere and get credentials that will qualify you to preach. You can't go to school and be qualified or learn how to preach. The preaching is in you. The education just gives you some fodder, some facts. But the call, the anointing is already in you. It's in your mouth. And that word is most effective when you feel that it has fallen to the ground. When I am weak, I'm strong. And I've learned that when you have nothing left to give, that's when you have the most to give. It's when you feel like you have fallen all over yourself and tongue lashed your own self that that word of God is most effective in hearts and lives of people. you got a special mouth. I, there's, there are a couple of scriptures here. You ever find a scripture and you don't know what to do with it? You know there's something there, but you haven't gotten to it yet. It's like you know there's some, something sweet on the inside, but you, you, can't, you can't seem to get to it. But you'll walk by and pick it up every once in a while. Well, this is one of them right here. And it's in Revelation chapter 10. And you already know what it is, I bet. Then the voice which I heard from heaven spoke to me again and said, go take the little book. Go take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel who stands on the sea and on the earth. So I went to the angel and said to him, give me the little book. And he said to me, take it and eat it. And it will make your stomach bitter. But it will be as sweet as honey in your mouth. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it. And it was as sweet as honey in my mouth. But when I had eaten it, my stomach became bitter. And he said to me, you must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. I, I'm not sure what to do with that, but I know i got to talk about it for just a second. Do you know you've got to have a bitter belly before you can have a sweet mouth? That's the order. That's how he said it. It's going to be bitter in your belly, but it, it'll be sweet in your mouth. Which means to me that before I can take a word that God has given to me, before it can become sweet to the ears of the people, I've got to experience it in the guts of my soul. I've got to suffer before I can relate to the suffering of the people. I have to be broken before I can speak a sweet word that will heal the people. That sounds pretty good right now. I, didn't, I think I just cracked it open. Are you hearing me today, preacher? That's why you've been called to suffer more than they do. Because there's a sweetness in you there's a, that has to be transferred or transformed from your bitter belly to your sweet tongue. Only God can do that. So as I eat this word, you know, I read things that I don't like. And there are things here that have to be preached that people don't like. And I go, maybe it's, you know, self-imposed, but I, I think people are madder at me than they really are. 
And I think they like me better than they really do. <laughs> I think, you know, I'm, a lot of people just don't even care. They don't care about me. I'm thinking, oh, uh, I hope they don't take this the wrong way. They don't even care. But it's my bitter belly. It's wanting to push it up. I'm wanting to get this out of me. But God has to do a work in my bitterness and my belly so that as it comes up to my mouth, it becomes sweet as honey. So if you're trying to figure out why you've suffered a lot in life or why you find yourself in a grind and a bind and why sometimes you don't want to preach and don't like to study and you'd rather run from the closet, you'd rather watch gun smoke than get in the presence of God... That's the reason. And it takes a soldier. It takes someone who realizes the hand of God is on them, that they do not belong to themselves. They've been bought with a price. To tighten it up and get back in that prayer closet and wait on God because if the bitterness in your belly is not transformed in the presence of God, it will come out as bitterness. Who understands what I'm saying? That bitterness has to be transformed by prayer. And I don't even mean emotional bitterness. I'm talking about the, the, the challenge of life and the call and the the toughness of, um, the, hey, listen, the impossibility of what God has called you to do. Do you know every time you stand up to preach, you're doing an impossible thing? And did you realize that you are going to be misunderstood? You are going to be misquoted? It's inevitable they do not hear it the way you say it. I have been amazed over the years. People come up and say, you know, last Sunday when you said, and I said, I didn't say that. I did not say what you said I said. Well, it's on the video. And you can watch the video, but it's still not what they heard. So God has called you to do the impossible. He did not call you to get results. He called you to preach. I'm, one of these days, I'm going to talk about the four things that are stifling our church. Not today. But God did not call you to build the biggest church. He called you to feed the flock. God did not call you to have the grandest programs. God called you to minister to him first and everything else he does. He said, I will build my church. Did he say it? I will build my church. You feed my sheep. And, he, and here's another scripture. I can't get my hand on it. I've tried a couple of times and I, I say, I'm never going to preach on that again. I do not know what it means, and here it is. You ready? So, uh, Mary is told that she's going to have a baby, Jesus. You call his name Jesus. And she goes to visit cousin Elizabeth in the hills of Judah, right? Now, Elizabeth's already carrying John the Baptist, about six months along. So she walks into the house and she greets Elizabeth and when, it, when she does, John the Baptist leaps in her womb. What in the world is going on there? You can't see it. Nobody can visualize it. But something deep is happening. The Jesus on the inside of Mary, touched the John 
on the inside of Elizabeth. And don't you know that's what preaching is? Preaching is not where somebody hears something they like and say, woo, 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 woo. Real preaching, the real Jesus in a real man or woman of God, speaking it will touch the insides, the spiritual depths, deep calls unto deep. The inside speaking to the inside, not flesh to flesh, but spirit to spirit. And I have a hallelujah. And I believe with all my heart, anointed preaching is just that. It's when you have paid the price, laid before God. He gives you a word. You feel totally incapable of handling it. And when you open your mouth with your special word in it, and your bitterness has been made sweet, then something doesn't just happen to them up here. It happens deep down on the inside, and the change is deep and spiritual, and praise God, it's forever. So I don't know what to do with that verse other than what I just did with it. And that was pretty good. I enjoyed that. Can I mention two more things? Dr. Bell, I don't, I don't rem remember the schedule. When am I supposed to cut loose? Don't worry about it. That's easy. People to say. These people have got to get to lunch. I want to do something here. Again, pastors, you know what it is to work on something for years? I want to, I want to bring something to your attention here. I want to go, uh, Stephen, or is it, who's back there today? Stephen? Go to Genesis 46, if you would, please. I don't know. I might go to 47. I think I will. 47. When Joseph finds out his brothers are who they are, and they just, you know, they're revealed to each other and reconciled, and they go and get dad, Jacob. I am amazed at what I've read here. Uh, Jacob settles in Goshen. Joseph made ready his chariot and went up to Goshen to meet his father. This is verse 29. He presented himself to him and fell on his neck, wept on his neck a good while. Mm. And Israel said to Joseph, Now I can die. I've seen your face. You're still alive. 31. Then Joseph said to his brothers and to his father's household, I'll go up and tell Pharaoh and say to him, My brothers and those of my father's house who were in the land of Canaan have come to me. The men are shepherds, for their occupation has been to feed livestock, and they've brought their flocks, their herds, and all that they have. Now listen to this. So it shall be when Pharaoh calls you and says, What is your occupation? You shall say, Your servant's occupation has been with livestock. From our youth even until now, both we and also our fathers, that, that you may dwell in the land of Goshen, for every shepherd is an abomination to the Egyptians. Here's what I read. Joseph said, we got to do this thing right now. He, had he forgotten that God had already arranged everything? And that if God could arrange everything to this point, could he not take care of this? And this is what I mean. He said, now, when we go in before Pharaoh, I want you to know shepherds are hated by Egyptians. Sheep are hated by Egyptians. One of their gods is a cow. So when you go in, don't say we're shepherds. Say we are herders. Now, what's the big deal there? I'll tell you what the big deal is. Let's keep reading. Uh, verse number 2. He in 47, he took five men from among his brothers and presented them to Pharaoh. Then Pharaoh said to his brothers, what's your occupation? And they said, your servants are shepherds, both we and also our fathers. I'll stop there because this is what I want to say. At that point, they had more integrity than Joseph did. Joseph was trying to be politically correct and play the game. And they said, but we aren't herd, herders. 
We don't mess with cows. We are shepherds. We're not ashamed of who we are. We're not going to play that game and change our name so the world will like us. And if you're not careful, this is where you got to just love me and trust me. You can realize we've been ashamed of being called preacher. We'd rather be called doctor or reverend or pastor. We've forgotten what a great call has been put on us. And so to, for the world to accept us so we can have legitimacy in the ranks of the world, we enjoy being called doctor because it sounds more professional. But can I say, God did not call me to be a professional. He called me to be a preacher. And I'm not ashamed of it. Oh, I went through the period, you know, I wanted Central, oh, oh, decades ago. Oh, I wanted us to be known in the community, and I wanted the, the, the city council to invite me to pray in front of them and pray at the Hornets games and all that bull. I wanted all of that. Then I realized, especially, what did I do then? Oh, I used, okay, sorry. All oh, that sheep. Okay, whatever. And it dawned on me one time when the Hornets, Charlotte Hornets, called me and said, we want you to pray at the game, before the game. We'll announce you and uh, you can pray before the game. I said, that's, that's what I've been after. And I got there and they said, now listen, you cannot say the name Jesus. You cannot mention anything that would be a religiously offensive to the crowds here. We want you to pray to God. I said, wait a minute, I can't, I don't know how to do that because there is no prayer unless it's in the name of Jesus by the power of the Spirit of Jesus. And you know what I did? I did what they asked me to do. I prayed this big, fat, generic, stupid, stinking, uh, politically correct, crowd-pleasing prayer. And as I walked out, I said, I'm done with this. And I've never done it again, and I've turned it down many times, and I won't do it because Jesus Christ bled and died for me. And if you are ashamed of me, I'll be ashamed of you. And if I let the world change my titles and, and my vernacular so that it sounds more pleasant to them, I have cheapened myself I have denied my calling. Folks, I have a doctorate, but I am not a doctor. I am a preacher. And I'm a preacher because before the foundation of the world, God laid his hand on me and called me out and made me different and put a word in my mouth and gave me an opportunity to stand up in his name. And I'm not ashamed of that. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I'm not ashamed of the Holy Ghost. I'm not ashamed of shouting and praising. I'm not ashamed of preaching like an old-fashioned, spirit-filled preacher. That's who we are. And I preach against sin, and I call it out, and I tell people there's a hell, and you'll burn in it if you don't come to Jesus. You don't get generic messages when you come here. Brother, when you leave here, you've heard about heaven and hell and God and Jesus and the devil. You've heard about it. That's the only thing that will save our world. One more thing and I'll turn it over. Back in 46 of Genesis beginning with verse 2. Then God spoke to Israel in the visions of the night and said, Jacob, Jacob. And he said, here I am. So he said, I am God. Can I stop a moment? What is it about those three words that just made chill bumps go up my back? 
that what just incited a sense of reverence when I just spoke those three words. I am God. The God of your father. Now listen to this, brothers and sisters. Do not fear to go down to Egypt. For I will make of you a great nation there. I will go down with you to Egypt. And I will also surely bring you up again and Joseph will put his hand on your eyes now I want to be gentle but I've been a camp meeting preacher a long time I don't even know how many camp meetings I've preached in over the years morning and night can't even tell you how many pastors conferences prayer conferences I did so many, I didn't know where I'd been. Or You know, you can do so many, you don't know where you are when you wake up some mornings. And then you wake up and say, what, what am I doing here? And in many of those gatherings, I've heard the overseer say something to this effect. We want to take the pastors to another level. There's another one, excuse me. <laughs> to the next level, the next level, the next level. I had one overseer that you would know invite me to a state. And after the first session, I went back to the room and my phone was ringing. It was he. He said, now, Loran, we're friends. But I didn't call you here to, to do what you did this morning. I want the fellows to go to the next level. I said, all right, let me be clear. What do you want me to do? Because I gave them what I thought God gave me. He said, I want you to inspire them. I want them to want to come back to camp meeting tomorrow and the next year. I said, okay. And I changed everything that the Lord laid on my heart. And I preached some little cheap, uh, thriller of a series where everybody could say, glory to God, preach it, and went home feeling like a prostitute. But I did what he asked me to do. He was in charge. So at one camp meeting, one guy, and you, you know all these guys, <laughs> they all want to make sure they get back to a state. Not Ken, he's my friend, he's a good man. I'm not talking about him. <laughs> Ron, I thought you were asleep, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, it was not Ron Martin. I've done more camp meetings for you, I guess, than anybody. It was not Ron Martin. But it, it was this guy. And I... Uh, he was standing there with a couple of his council members. He said, I kind of wanted it a little higher than that. I said, I want to take him to the next level. I said, but what if the next level is down? What are you trying to do to these guys? They're hungry. They need direction. They want revival. They don't want to just get thrilled. They know what a cheap thrill is. They want God to do a deep work in their lives. What if the next level for them is down? That's when I saw this. I'm the God of your father. Do not fear to go down. See, we're afraid of trials, troubles, of loss of membership, loss of income, loss of inspiration. We don't want to go down. But God said, don't be afraid to go down. Don't be afraid of a pandemic. Don't be afraid of political unrest. Don't be afraid of racial questions. I'll go down with you. I'm not sending you down by yourself. I'm going down with you. But remember this, that's where I'm going to make you great. When you get down as low as you can go, that's when I'm going to make you great. 
and then I will surely bring you up again. Can somebody say amen? Bless you. You did exactly what I wanted you to do. I mean that. I wanted you to hear from God and speak what God wanted us to hear. As I was sitting there, a scripture came to me in Revelation. He opens the book with a letter to the seven churches, and he said, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying. And God is speaking to us here in Western North Carolina. And I couldn't ask you for a better presentation. It wasn't a presentation. It was a word from the Lord. And that's what I wanted. When I invite speakers to speak, I don't assign them something to say. I said, I want you to hear from God. Give us what you've heard from God. And that's what we received this morning. You've touched me. The thing I appreciate about, appreciate about Pastor Livingston, Preacher Livingston, is that he has not professionalized the pastorate. After 44 years, he could have. He knows what to do. He knows what buttons to push. But he has a fresh word from the Lord every Sunday. And you think about it now. He preached twice yesterday, preached this morning. He's leading the prayer meeting tonight, preaching in the morning, in Wednesday morning. And this is usually his week for vacation. And when I called him and asked him if he would speak to us, he changed his vacation plan so he could be with us because I felt like God wanted to say something through him to us and he's done it this morning and I appreciate that so very much Brother Livingston and he'll have another word from God for us tonight during the prayer meeting if you haven't experienced this prayer meeting it's been going on now almost two years and God laid on his heart to call a prayer meeting and it'll be crowded tonight his folks will be here and we're just going to let him have his prayer meeting as part of our camp meeting service. Isn't that a wild idea? I just think it's a tremendous idea to, to be a part of the prayer meeting here at Central. And you will be blessed in the prayer meeting tonight. And then following, we're delighted to have Dr. Mark Williams to be our speaker this week. He will have a message from God for us too. Pastor at North Cleveland, former general overseer. And I appreciate him so very much. Again, we... I've tried several times to get him, and we finally got him for last year, and then COVID canceled, but he was gracious enough to come this year with us, and he'll have a word from God for us tonight. At 6 o'clock tonight, we're doing our ordination bishop ceremony and also our retiree ceremony, and I hope you'll come. I'm doing it before service because I don't want anything to distract from worship. I believe when we come to the house of God, we do too much distractions, too much other stuff. And this is important, though. So I want to take that time to do that tonight. If you can be here at 6 o'clock, I know traffic is an issue. I understand that. But I said something to somebody earlier this morning. Years ago, they would walk for hours. We complained about having to drive. I look forward to seeing you tonight. Would you pray for Brother Williams this afternoon and Brother Livingston this afternoon? God bless him in the Brother Montgomery in the morning and then Matt Tucker on Wednesday morning that God will use them again to speak to us what we need to hear. You can take a pitchfork and say, oh, that's good for that other brother, that other preacher, but it was for us. The word you heard this morning was for me, was for you. And I hope you hear, will hear what the Spirit is saying. Brother, sorry, I know you were supposed to come back and take up the offering, but the offering... Ushers will be at the door as you leave. If you'd like to give in the offering, we appreciate all your gifts of love. Appreciate you being here this morning. Have you been blessed of God? Would you stand? Would you stand? I believe when God blesses us, we ought to thank him for it, don't you? Would you thank God for the words you heard this morning? Father, money could not buy the message we heard this morning.